Joining us now is the editor of The New Yorker magazine's website, Nicholas Thompson. Nick, it's good to have you here tonight. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, I am uh, a user of the online machine, but not an expert. <laughs> and I bet that I didn't explain that exactly exactly right. How does this strong box idea work exactly? And did I screw any of that up? You've got it absolutely right. and You can set it up perfectly. So the, the way it works is that it begins with a system called Tor. And a Tor is a way of keeping your computer address safe. It's like if I hand you a package, in between, I also break up the package and give it to 100 people in between. So once you've logged into Tor, no one can identify the computer it initially comes from. So the person starts by logging into Tor. Then the file that they want to upload is encrypted. Then the encrypted file is passed through Tor, passed through our servers, to us. It's still encrypted. We take it off a machine onto a little flash drive. And then we take it onto another computer that's not connected to the internet and that doesn't have a hard drive. And there we decrypt it. So the whole time, from when it passes from you to me, there's no way to trace where it came from. It's encrypted the entire time. And by the time somebody at the New Yorker looks at the file, they're looking at a computer that's not connected to the internet and that doesn't have a hard drive. So there's kind of an air break between the machine and between uh, you. In reading the, the fine print um, on, the, on, on what's posted online right right yeah. now. It's marketed as an as-is product. There are no yeah. guarantees, and you can't be absolutely sure that anonymity uh, can be protected. Other people have sort of tried to build things like this in the past, yeah. but they've essentially been hackable, haven't they? There's been ways to get around the anonymity protections in previous iterations? Right. There, there have been. One of the things that we did is to, to start with Tor, which gives you a lot of extra protection. It makes it a lot harder to use. It's relatively difficult to use the system, but we think that the people who are going to give us stuff that will make for great investigative New Yorker stories are going to be people who are going to figure out and who going to be able to do it. So, you know, maybe somebody will end up cracking it. I sure hope not. Aaron Swartz is a fantastic coder. We put built in lots of protections. We tested it. We had very smart people try to break it. So we feel very confident in it. So we'll, we'll see. One of the things that I think about in a slightly bigger picture about leaks, and I thought about this a lot around WikiLeaks and some of the scandal, or, or at least the controversy there, is that when you get anonymously leaked information. As a reporter, as somebody who's trying to decide what the news news value of that, right. it's important to know where it came from. In part so you know that if somebody's got an ax to grind, if they are the person who is capable, either by circumstance or by experience, of faking that information to you, yeah. it's hard to verify leaked information. With no ability to trace back, even, a, even confidentially, mm -hmm. are you worried that New Yorker journalists using this material are themselves a little bit compromised? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it makes it makes the process of creating a long story more complicated if you get information and you have no idea where it came from and you have no possibility of figuring out where it came from. Right. You know, we can put a message on a bulletin board on the person with their stupid secret password or stupid secret pass name, as you described. We'll maybe go to the bulletin board and maybe see our message and maybe write back to us, but we may just have it. And then it's a hard editorial choice. We'll do our best to verify it. If we can't verify it, we have a whole bunch of other choices to make. But those are choices that we've dealt with before. I mean, people mail us stuff. People have sent us information anonymously before. So, you know, it creates different journalistic problems, but we'll figure those out. Do you expect that this is going to be something that will be used by lots of different types of journalists or even non-journalistic communication? Anybody can use it at your website. Anybody can use it at our website. It may be, it's, when, when we first conceived of it, I thought it was going to be people sending us documents. But then one of our editors said, well, actually, you know, it would be a great way to communicate with one of my writers when they're working in Syria. It would actually be a great way to get information back and forth. The code is open source. That's part of Aaron Swartz's idealism. So other people are going to build their versions of it. If the White House wants to build a version, so people in in China, just as you were saying, can upload information to them in a more secure way, then great. You know, so we'll see exactly where this goes, but I hope we're going to get a lot of great stories out of this in the next few years. Nicholas Thompson, NewYorker.com editor, thank you so much for helping us understand this. I thank really you. appreciate it. I will note that on that China story, as the, the, the Chinese press and also some of the American press followed up on that petition from that Chinese activist being posted at the White House website, the White House's response was, yes, the White House, we the people petition is not only here, is not only something that we will not help the Chinese police find anybody through, but it's open source and available to anybody, and we're happy to provide this, uh, this code, this means of communicating online to anybody who wants it. It is an open source world, even if it makes a lot of us oogie. We'll be right back.